we're going into the series of community, and we're still continuing on that. And I would like to thank you all for those who are online who are showing up. Even though you're in your pajamas, thank you for showing up online. And to those who showed up here physically, thank you for showing up not in your pajamas. I really do appreciate that as well. We're going into our ser uh, service, and we're talking about relationship, community, how to do community together. And that's the series that we are in right now. And this sermon, I titled it Relationship 101. Basically, how to do relationships. Now, I wanted to title it um, How to Do Relations, but um, that's, that's not the right no. topic because of reasons. Reasons I chose not to do that. But Relationship 101 is what we're going to talk about today. How to do relationship. Now, during the series of community, which we are in right now, we're talking about ways of deepening our relationships within the church and also outside of church. Deepening the community within our church, family, and reaching out to love to our community around our church family. Those are the two things that we are focusing. Community within and community without. The reason why we are doing this is because we are better together. We can't, we're not good on our own because God said it, and even all the way back in Genesis, it is not good for man to be alone. Why? Because we are better together. We're created for community. We are wired for relationships. We are formed for a family. As it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 5, it says this, Christ makes us one body and individuals who are connected to each other. We are connected with each other. The person that is sitting right next to you right now, you are connected with them. If you're at home, the person that's watching this with you, you are connected with them. But the problem is sin. Sin is a big problem, and it's easy to get disconnected. Just like if you have spectrum, you know how easy it is for your internet to get disconnected? Can't stand that. It, you can easily get disconnected from your internet. You can easily get disconnected from your children, easily disconnected from your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, family, your spouse. You can even get disconnected from church or from your small group. And if you're not in a small group, you need to join a small group. So the question that we're going to answer today is why do relationships fall apart? Why do relationships go bad? What destroys relationships and how do you rebuild them? Or how do you build new ones or how do you prevent relationships from going bad? So, how do we stay connected? How many of us are in a small group right now? And those online, you can raise your hand too, I can see it. Or just put in the chat box, I'm in a small group. Go ahead and chat that right now. Here's a little secret if you're in a small group or you're planning on joining a small group, which I hope everyone does, is that you're going to have differences in a small group. You're not going to agree with everybody in your small group. Just like in your family, you're not going to agree with everything with everyone in your family. The only people that agree with everything are dead people. If you are in a small group and you agree with everything that everyone says, either you're being dishonest or you're just filled with dead people in your small group. So those are two things. If you're in a small group, you will experience differences. And why is that? Because God loves a variety. In a small group, it teaches us relational skills. If you are around people who are different than you, you can learn from them. Small groups is the perfect lab for learning relational skills. Small groups, it gives you the skills that can be applied to anything. It can be applied to your family. It can be applied to your work, your career. It can be applied to your marriage. 
It could even be applied to any ministry that you are serving in. Small groups, that's the lab for learning these important skills, the relational skills, how to relate with people who are different than you. But unfortunately, relationship skills is something that we do not learn in school. It's a very vital skill that we need, but it's not taught to us. It's the most important thing that we need in life. So today we're going to look at how relationships get destroyed, what destroys them, and also what builds them. We're going to look at what destroys relationships and what builds them. Again, these things can be applied to your family, your marriage, your friends, your work, your career, and even small group. Now, these things, if you take notes, can save you tens of thousands of dollars. Now, with that money that you save, I do have a cash app. You can um, just send that over my way. Hopefully, we could get it on my cash app on the screen down below. If not, see me afterwards, and then I'll let you know, give you that information. But on a serious note, it can save you counseling sessions from these skills that we're going to teach you. The Bible is our greatest source for counseling material, for guidance. God is our ultimate counselor, and I can take payment for it as well. God has said that every relational problem comes down to one of four negative attitudes. And we're going to go over those four negative attitudes. Every problem you have in a relationship come as a result of one of these four problems. They are the enemies of community. The first one, public enemy number one, is selfishness. Selfishness destroys relationships. That is public enemy number one. Selfishness is the cause of conflict. Selfishness is the cause of arguments. Selfishness is the cause of divorce. Selfishness is the cause of war. You have one dictator says, I want this. And another ruler says, no, you can't have that. I want this. And then war happens. What does the Bible say about this? In James chapter 4, it says, what causes fights and quarrels? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. Selfishness. Everything starts because our self-centeredness. It's very easy to allow selfishness to creep in. When you start a relationship, it all starts off selfless. You know, you open the door, you you pull out chairs, and then as the relationship goes further on, the selfishness creeps in. It's like, you have hands. You can open up your own door. You can pull your own seat. I'm not doing that. It's, It's too much work. Selfishness creeps in. We put more energy into building and starting relationships than to maintaining them. You have to work at it. In marriage, there's like five stages of when your spouse is sick, how you treat that person. In the first year, you're like, baby, darling, I'm worried about that sniffle. I've called the paramedics to rush you to to Kaiser for a checkup. And and I I know that you don't like the food there, so I prepared gourmet gourmet meals to, to feed you for the week that you are in the hospital. That's the first year. Second year of marriage, sweetheart, I don't like the sound of that cough. I've arranged for the doctor to make a house call. Let let me tuck you into bed. That's the second year. The third year, you you look like you've got a fever. Why don't you drive yourself over to CVS, get some medicine. I'll watch the kids. That's the third year. The fourth year, be sensible. After you fed and bathed the kids and washed the dishes, you really ought to go to bed. The fifth year. Wow, 
Do you have to cough so loud? I can't hear the TV. Would you mind going into the other room while the show is still on? I mean, you sound like a barking dog. That's the fifth year. So you, st- you see where selfishness start to creep in. There was this one guy who said about his marriage. He said, in the first year of marriage, my wife used to bring me slippers and the dog came barking in. Now my dog brings me slippers. <laughs> if there were more courting in marriages, there'd be fewer marriages in court. You have to date your mate. You have to date them. We stop making the effort and selfishness just slide right on in. So why, why don't we change? Or better yet, why can't we change? The first thing is that selfishness, is, it's just natural. It's just natural for us to be selfish. You know, I think about me, I think about my needs, my wants, my desires, and you think about you. You think about what you want, your desires. You know, I think about me, you think about you. Even a baby, when they're first born, the first thing that they say is, I, I, that is what they're screaming. They're screaming about themselves. If, you, if anyone ever been around a baby, they're the most self-centered creature on this planet. All they want is for you to feed them. They want you to hold them. They want you to change them. After you change them for a couple of months, you think they'll get it and they'll be able to do it themselves. But no, they still need you to change it for like a year or two, three, three years about so. They're very self-centered and you don't have to teach them that. They come out the womb selfish. Selfish little, I have four of them. Selfish. Some people might ask, if there is a God, why is there evil in this world? If there is a God, why is there evil? That's a very simple question to answer. We have evil because we're all selfish. We're all selfish. When I want what I want and you want what you want, it causes conflict. The, the, the better question is, why is there good in this world? And the answer to that is that because of God. That's why. Because of God. Darwin said it best himself where we, 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 it's like the survival of the fittest. You do what you can to survive. That's the natural way of life. There's only good because there is a God. Survival of the fittest is not about being good. It's about doing what you need to do to survive. So first, it's natural. It's in our human nature. And the second thing is that our culture feeds self-centeredness. Think about all of the ads that you see. Obey your thirst. What is that telling you? It's not just telling you just drink Sprite. No, it's telling you to obey your carnal desires. Obey your thirst. If you're thirsty for this, go get it. If you're hungry for this, go get it. If you're angry, do this. Obey your natural instincts. Burger King, have it your way. Whatever you want, it's yours. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. How self-centered is that? It's telling you that promiscuity is allowed in Vegas as long as it just stays there. Gambling and wasting all your money is allowed in Vegas as long as you just keep it there. You know, Las Vegas is really a mispronunciation of the word. The actual word is lost wages. That's what it is. You go there, you're going to lose your wages. I think that's what it's Spanish for as well. Don't quote me on that if you speak Spanish. Don't correct me. Just leave it alone. (laughs) Proverbs 28 verse 25 says this about selfishness. Selfishness only causes trouble. That's all it's good for. Trouble. So what is the antidote to selfishness? If selfishness destroys relationships, what builds them up? Selflessness builds them. Selflessness is what builds up relationships. 
It's, it's just a little bit uh, less of me, a little bit more of you. That's what selflessness is. Just a little bit less of me, and I'm going to think more about you. Not my needs, your needs. Not my wants, your wants. Not about my hurts. Let's talk about your hurts. It says here in Philippians 2, it says, look out for one another's interests, not just for your own. A little bit less of me, a little bit more of you. Now, if you start acting selfless in relationships, it's going to cause a change in that person. Because that person has to change the way they relate to you. It's going to transform that relationship. It's not only going to transform the relationship, but it's also going to cause a change in the person. So start acting selfless in these relationships. Now, God's favorite place to teach you selflessness is in your family. Right? Once you have kids... Now as, once you start, when you marry somebody, that's an immediate family right there. You have to learn about selflessness. You mean I still can't do what I want to do? <laughs> no. I have to think about my wife. And then now my kids are in. It's like we can't go to the movies every weekend now because we have a one-year-old at home. We have to start being selfless. So family is a great opportunity for you to learn about selflessness. If you have siblings, growing up with siblings, it can't be just, this is mine and that's it, you can't have any. No, you have to learn how to share because sharing is caring, right? Another opportunity that we provide you here at Lighthouse to learn more about selflessness is small group. If you're not in a small group, you have to join a small group. Now, why? Because the people that are closest to you, those are the ones that you meet up on a, clo uh, on a regular basis. Those are the people that help you to be selfless. Now, on Sunday mornings when you come to church, it's easy to be selfless in a crowd. Why? Because we don't require much from you on Sunday mornings. All I require of you is to just sit up and listen, take notes, and don't go to sleep. That's all I'm asking you. That's it. But in a small group, in a family, there's more that's required of you. So family, small group, that's where you, you learn how to be with people who are different than you. Even in your immediate family, your brothers, your sisters, they're different than you. And you have to learn relational skills and how to relate with them. Same thing in a small group. You have to learn how to, you know, the give and take of learning with people who are different than you. Learning how to relate with them. So, once you join a small group, here are some things that you can do to be selfless in a small group. The first thing you can do is show up. Show up to your small group meetings. You know, it's easy to just, you know, stay home and not go to it, but just show up because you are needed for somebody to learn how to relate with you and for you to learn how to relate with other people. Right now, most small groups are meeting online. There's no excuse why you can't meet in a small group. It's just a click away, and then you're there. Another thing you can do to be selfless in a small group is by accepting new people in your group. You can't just be like, no, it's just us four and no more. No, you have to be open and willing to let other people experience the same benefits of a small group that you are experiencing. You can't be cliquish with your small group. You have to learn how to accept other people and be okay with that. Another thing you could do is by really listening to the people in your small group. You have to listen to them. You can't just not pay attention to them and just, okay, this person is just going to talk about his problems all over again. No, you have to really listen and be able to be there for that person. Also, offering people help in your small group is another thing you can do. 
You can't just listen to somebody who said, oh, I don't have any uh, money for groceries. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow about food. And you can't just say, well, the Bible did say man should not live by bread alone. No. You have to do something. Offer help in the way that you can offer help. One of the most selfish things you can do in a small group is by being a host. Hosting it. Opening up your home or opening up the communication channel for a small group. If you're not in a small group and you would like to start one, we can give you the opportunity to do that. All you have to do is bring two or three friends in your small group. And one of the best things you can do if you open up your home for a small group is by not hiding the best snacks. (laughs) Don't hide the best. Don't hide the good stuff. Allow the good stuff to be there. Nobody want the cheap, you know, Aldi Oreo cookies. No, we want the real Oreo cookies. Yeah, the real one. You heard me. Galatians chapter 6 says this. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, and ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. All he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvests a crop of real life and eternal life. Now, this passage is talking about one of the most important principles that God has created in the universe. And that principle is the principle of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. If I plant an apple seed and what grows is an orange tree, I might be, there, there's some confusion there. Either I don't know what apple seeds look like or I don't know what apples look like. There's something wrong in this picture. If I plant something, I'm expecting what I plant to grow. If I plant orange seeds, I'm expecting oranges to grow. Same thing in life. If you plant criticism, what's going to come back to you? Criticism. If you plant affirmation, what's going to come back? Affirmation. The principle of sowing and reaping is all around us. Now, in this passage, it tells us three things about this. The first thing is that it tells us to respond to God, not to other people. Not to what others do to you. It's like if somebody is yelling at you, you don't come back by yelling at them back. You know, the Bible says that you, you overcome evil with what? Good. You don't respond the way that your natural tendency, your selfishness will respond. You respond not even to the person, but the passage that we just read says respond to God. That means act like the person that is in front of you, see through them and look behind them because Jesus is right there standing, looking at you to see how you're going to respond to that person. Don't respond to them. See through them and see Jesus. How are you going to respond to Jesus about that situation? Are you going to respond in a retaliatory way? Or are you going to respond with good because Jesus is watching your response is your responsibility no matter what you can't say that person made me angry no one can make you angry you can say I chose to be angry because that person did that but you can't say no one made you angry no you chose to be angry perfect example is you could be fighting with your spouse arguing or in a heated fellowship with your spouse and the telephone rings and you could just change your voice immediately. Oh, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm great. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Bye. And then you did. It's a choice. You choose to be upset at that situation. So instead of choosing to be angry, choose to respond to God. In that situation, because Jesus is always watching. No matter what, Jesus 
is there. So if you just picture Jesus right behind the person, you should respond accordingly. Another thing that we see in this passage is that God rewards selflessness. He rewards it. It says here that those who do these things harvest a crop of real life. That means real life right now, in the living, right now, in the physical world, right now, you harvest a real life. And then it says eternal life. So the life right now, you will be rewarded and also in eternal life. God is saying here that the more unselfish you are, the more he blesses you. Why does he do this? Because he wants you to be like him. That's why. Because God is a selfless God. God doesn't have to do the things that he does for you. He doesn't have to bless you. He's not obligated to do these things, but he does these, these things because he is selfless. And he wants us to be selfless. So he rewards us whenever we are selfless. That's the only way to live. Jesus said of himself, only those who learn to give their lives away will ever know what it means to really live. You don't know what living is until you give your life away. He wants us to be unselfish. And the way to be unselfish is to love. Love others. The most important thing that God says, that Jesus said, was the greatest commandment is to love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. That is the most important commandment. The next important commandment is love others. Love your neighbors as yourself. So after you learn how to love God, you, you then learn how to love yourself. And then with this same love, overflowing love, you love other people. And one way to do that is to be unselfish. So that is the antidote to selfishness, unselfishness. Also, we see here that it says God's spirit do the work, the growth work in him that harvests a crop of real life and eternal life. So we see here that it is a growth process. It is a process of growth. That means it's not going to happen overnight. It's not like the beans from Jack and the Beanstalk where you just plant it and overnight you have this large beanstalk. No, life does not work that way. It doesn't happen overnight, and also it happens with God's Spirit. You have to have God's Spirit for it to work. If you're out there, if anybody has a green thumb, if you plant something, you have to do your part. You have to plant it. You have to water it. You have to allow it to be in a spot where it can get plenty of sun. You have to put fertilizer in it. And then God's Spirit makes it grow. You don't make it grow. You just put it in an environment for it to grow. But God allows it to grow. You can do the same exact things and God's spirit may not allow it to grow. So God's spirit is in this. It doesn't happen overnight and God's spirit is within this. In Galatians 5, it says, live freely, animated, and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. You see, we are all compulsively selfish. Anyone can be unselfish once in a while. Now, you know that if you're being unselfish, that you one way you can know that this is being motivated by you to be unselfish is if you let pride creep in. If you say stuff like, yeah, I felt noble doing that. Yeah, that look at me. Look, look what I did. Look, 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 look what I did. I'm so great. I'm a, what a great person I am. I am so benevolent. I am so charitable. That is pride creeping in, and that is not motivated by God's spirit. Unselfishness, for it to be a lifestyle, we have to let God's spirit do the growth work inside of us. When we allow God's spirit to come inside of us, then we will be motivated by God's spirit to be unselfish. That's when we grow. So the second enemy 
to what destroys relationships is pride. Pride destroys relationships. Proverbs 13.10 is a good memory verse, um, especially for married couples. Proverbs 13.10 says this, pride leads to arguments. If you're in an argument, one thing that probably led to it is pride. Pride shows up in a lot of different ways. Pride shows up when you're being critical and judgmental of somebody. Pride can show up when you're being competitive or when you're comparing When you're comparing spouses, you're comparing houses, comparing cars, comparing lawns even, pride can show up. Pride can show up in stubbornness when when you can't apologize to somebody. Or the way you apologize is, if if I may have offended you, then I'm so That's not an apology. If I may have offended you, no, that's not an apology. If you're offended by this, I'm sorry. That's not an apology. An apology is being able to say, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Not those words exactly, but along those lines. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Pride can also show up in your shallow and your superficial relationships. When you're shallow, you're saying that you're too shallow to care about other people. Pride is in the midst of that. Now, how does pride show up in a small group if you're in a small group? When, when you always have, a, have to tell a story that tops the last one. You're like, you, you did that, but listen to this one. That, that, that's pride. You don't have to one-up stories. When you're always offering advice and never asking for advice, that, that's a little prideful. You always have solutions for other people, but you're never asking people for help. You're never asking other people for advice. Pride can also show up in a small group when, when, when you never are the one who t- to talk about your tough day. Everyone has, else has like, man, I had a tough week. This is what happened to me. And you never have anything to say like, your days are always great. You never have a tough day, and you never share about that, because, again, your days are always great. The problem with pride is that pride uh, oftentimes is self-deceiving. You don't know that you're being prideful. It is tell- you don't think you're being prideful. Other people have to tell you that you're being prideful, and if they do, you have to listen to them, because pride is self-deceiving. You don't know you're being prideful. Everyone else sees it, but you can't. Proverbs 16, 18 says this about pride. Pride will destroy a person. A proud attitude leads to ruin. You don't know it's happening. It's like if you eat too many fatty foods. It tastes good. But you don't know that it's destroying you. You don't don't feel your arteries clogging. You don't feel those things. But pride will destroy you in that same manner. I like the message translation of it. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. If you had a very hard fall, if you're like Humpty Dumpty and you fell and you broke and it's, your ego is shattered in pieces, that's, that's how big your ego was. The harder you fall, the bigger your ego was. Pride destroys relationships. Humility is what builds them. Humility builds relationships. There are five things that build relationships, and it's stated in 1 Peter 3, verse 8, and it says this, Live in harmony. Be sympathetic. Love each other. Have compassion. And be humble. In all of our relationships, we want these five things. We want to live in harmony. We want to be sympathetic. We want to love each other. We want to have compassion, and we want to be humble. Now, being humble gives you all of the rest of the four things. But let's talk about harmony. What is harmony? Harmony, if you're in the music industry, you know that harmony and unison are 
two different things. Unison means that everyone is the same. Everyone is playing the same sound. It's the same note. But harmony, harmony is when everyone is playing a different sound to make something a greater sound, a more beautiful sound collectively. That is what harmony is. Not one instrument is overplaying the other. Not one voice is oversinging another person. It's harmony. If you've ever seen a symphony, you see all different instruments playing together to bring one beautiful sound. The flute is playing this note. The drums is playing this. The, the trumpet is playing this. That is harmony. You don't have a flute player standing up on the chair and playing as loud as he can because that is going to ruin the harmony. You want harmony in relationships. And the way to achieve that is by being humble. Philippians 2 says this, Be humble and give more honor to others than to yourselves. Your attitude should be the same that Jesus Christ had. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Jesus Christ humbled himself. Now, how can you achieve humility? The way you can achieve humility is by being around somebody who's humble. You tend to be like the people you hang around with. If you hang around people who are grumpy, you're going to tend to be grumpy. If you hang around people who are envious, you're going to tend to be envious. If you hang around people who are angry and just want to fight all the time, you're going to tend to be that way. So one person you can be with who is very humble is Jesus Christ. Spend more time with Jesus. If you want to be humble, spend more time with Jesus. Because spending more time with Jesus is what enables us to be more humble. The third thing that destroys relationships is insecurity. Insecurity destroys relationships. Proverbs 29 verse 25 says this, The fear of human opinion disables. How many of us ever felt that way? Someone else's opinion disables you. You cannot go on because of somebody else's opinion. You know, when I'm so insecure that all I think about is your opinion and what you think of me, that disables my life. I might as well get a handicap sticker and park and, and have that free, uh, the, the, the close park, the best parking spot in the house with insecurity. That fear, that insecurity fear tends to cause us to try to control each other. My insecurity tries to control other people's opinions about me. And my insecurity also resists others' control over me. It's all about insecurity. Insecurity destroys relationships. But there's a huge dilemma. In our spirit, we long to be close with people, but we also fear being close with people. We long to, to have real intimacy with people, but we're scared to death of intimacy. That's a huge dilemma that we're in. Insecurity prevents intimacy. And that's why shacking up doesn't work. Shacking up does, does not work. If you don't know what shacking up is, is when you're living with somebody that you're not married to. That is what shacking up is. Because there's no real commitment there. There's always this insecurity that's there that if I say something wrong, he or she may kick me out. I may not have a place to live anymore. So you walk on eggshells and you have this false sense of intimacy. We're good because we're not fighting. We're good. Insecurity prevents intimacy. But when that fear 
vanishes. When there's real commitment there, that's when real intimacy show up. That's when in, real intimacy is visible, when the fear is gone. So in these relationships, what do we fear? Most people fear, number one, exposure. We fear that somebody's going to find out what we're really like. We fear, so we hide. And that is man's oldest fear. If you look back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 10, it says this. This is Adam speaking. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. I hid. I was insecure about my exposure, so I hid. And we've been hiding ever since. We are afraid of our emotional nakedness. There are lots of people who are, aren't afraid of the physical nakedness, and they should be, they ought to be, but you see a lot of people with beach bodies that are out there just flaunting their stuff and, and showing body parts that they should not be showing, but those people are not afraid of their physical nakedness. More power to them. But surveys have shown that models, people that, the bodies of models, that people who, People who envy their bodies, right? These models, they're like the standard of the perfect body. They're the most insecure people on, in this planet. They're very insecure. Emotional insecurity is there because man's nature is to fear exposure. Fear makes us dishonest and it causes us to build up walls, so that we don't have intimacy. Because I'm insecure and I want to hide behind my wall. But the thing that you're missing out on, God created all of us so that we have this one desire. Our desire is to be fully known by somebody else. And also for us to fully know somebody else. We want to be fully known and we want to fully know someone that is our ultimate desire. Married or not, we want to fully know someone and we want someone to fully know us. But fear of exposure gets us to build up walls. Not only does fear of exposure exist, there's also a fear of rejection. We've all been through rejection, right? Nobody has ever been rejected before. We've all been rejected before. And we, because of that rejection, some people build up walls and say, you know what? I will never be hurt this way ever again. I'm not going to allow this person to do this to me ever again. And I'm not going to allow anyone to do this to me ever again. Maybe you've been hurt by rejection by somebody, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, an ex, even a parent who said maybe you, you, you're never going to amount to anything. You're not good enough. Maybe you felt the sting of rejection by a teacher or a coach or someone you looked up to. Maybe you felt rejection by, by even church. Lots of people go through church hurt. Even in your small group, you probably felt the sting of rejection. And if you've ever felt rejected before. I just want to say to you, I am sorry that you've been through that. I am very sorry. But you cannot build up walls. You have to be exposed again. That's the only way you can fulfill the desire that God has placed in every single one of us. The desire to fully know and to, fully, to be fully known by somebody else. You have to be vulnerable. And as your teacher right now, my responsibility is to beg you to not let that rejection harden your heart. Don't build up a wall. Because when you do that, you're building up a self-imposed prison. And you're going to be in prison of loneliness. You don't want to build up that wall. Be vulnerable again. If you're not vulnerable, you're not living. You're just existing. Take the risk to be vulnerable again. 
Now, if insecurity destroys relationships, what builds them up? What builds them up is love. Love builds them. 1 John 4, 18 says, Love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. All fear. Not some fear. Not the fear of just this. No, it expels all fear. If you don't know what expel means, if you've been in school and you were expelled, that means you can't come here anymore. You've been kicked out. You are dismissed. That's what love does to fear. It expels it. It's no longer allowed on the premises. If you come around, your police is going to come. You're trespassing. You will be arrested. If we are afraid, it shows that his love has not been perfected in us. If you are afraid, his love is not perfected in us. So how does that work? How does love expel all fear? What it does is that it takes the focus off of me and puts the focus on you. Fear, love takes the focus off of me, what I think and how I feel, and it puts it on you. I think about what you think, how you feel. For example, people ask um, oftentimes speakers, aren't you nervous when you speak in front of a large group of people? And the way that you're not nervous, you don't get nervous, is, it, is if you don't think about yourself, you think about the people who are hearing. For me, I'm loving you guys. I want to love you guys, and the message that I'm sharing with you is important for you to grow. That's why I'm not nervous up here. Now, if I was thinking about me, like I'm thinking about the sound of my voice, because we all know we hate the sound of our own voice, if I'm thinking about that and how I sound coming out of these speakers, I'm going to be very nervous. And I'm going to start just stuttering and mumbling, tripping, tripping over my voice and trying to change my voice and trying to sound more like the way I think I sound. And that's going to mess me up. So what love does, it takes the focus off of me and puts it on you. In any relationship, in any place where you feel nervous and insecure, when you focus on the other person, it has the power to expel fear, to take fear out of your life, to kick fear away. The fear of exposure, gone. The fear of rejection, gone. Why? Because you take the focus off of you and you put the focus on the other person, and you're focusing on loving. So how do we find that power to focus on other people? You have to realize how much God loves you. Yes, you. God loves you. God loves you. And when you realize that, you, you don't think about how much you have to prove yourself to anybody because God already loves you. You don't have to focus on trying to impress other people because God created you the way that you are, and he loves it. God loves you just the way you are. Cue the Bruno Mars song. My identity, my self-worth is not caught up on, in what you think about me because you might be having a bad day that day. And you're mistaken. It, there's some, it's not my problem that you don't like me. It's your problem because God loves me. You have a problem if you don't like me. God loves me. I need to be caught up in my relationship with God. That's it. I'm, I should not be pressured by anyone's expectation of me. Just God's expectation of me. If I understand and know that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, I don't care about what you think of me because God loves me. All of us want that. So where do you get it? 1 John 4 verses 15 through 17 says this, All who proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them. We know how much God loves us and we have 
And we have put our trust in him. God is love. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid. Our love comes from God. God is love. And it also says that it grows. That means that it is a life long process. You're not going to just be a loving person immediately tomorrow. Again, it's not the beans from Jack and the Beanstalk. No, it's, it's something that is going to happen in us a little bit every day. It's on a moment by moment basis. It's on a second by second basis that we allow growth to take place. You can't defeat insecurity overnight. But you can take the first step right now that is beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ or even strengthening a relationship that you already have in Jesus Christ. When you say yes to Jesus, you're saying yes to the kind of love that can grow us and the kind of love that can throw fear out of our lives. We need to have love. And the fourth obstacle, the fourth enemy of relationship is resentment. Resentment. Resentment destroys relationships. Job 5 verse 2 says this, To worry yourself to death with resentment is a foolish, senseless thing to do. Being resentful is dumb. Being resentful is stupid. Being resentful here in the Bible says it is foolish. Everybody blows it. Everybody makes mistakes. No one bats a thousand. No one shoots at a hundred percent accuracy. No one is perfect. And because we're all imperfect, that means that we're going to hurt. I'm going to hurt somebody. Somebody's going to hurt me, intentionally or unintentionally. We are going to experience hurt in this life, and that is a fact. You can fact check me. If you've never been hurt before, you're going to get hurt sooner or later. But you will experience hurt. And now what's more important is not that you got hurt. What's more important is what you do with that hurt. What do you do with that hurt is more important than you got hurt. Are you going to allow that hurt to make you better? Or are you going to allow that hurt to make you bitter? Are you going to allow it to make you resentful? Are you going to allow it to make you carry a grudge? What are you going to do with that hurt? Be better or be bitter? The Bible, history, our personal experiences tells us that opposites attract. And then when they get married, opposites attack. Right? Right? What what fascinates you now irritates you later. Right? You, You could be like, you could be like stargazing at somebody and it's like, oh, look at that person. Look how boisterous he is. Look how loud he is. Oh, look how full of life and vivacious this specimen is. Man, I am not like this at all. I am so shy and so quiet. Wow, I am so attracted to that person because of this. And then you start dating, and then you get married, and then now you're saying, do you have to be loud all the time? What fascinated you first now irritates you. Opposites attract, and then opposites attack. Often, it's not the big things in life that causes us resentful resentment, but it's the small things that piles on and piles on. It's that last straw that broke the camel's back. 
It doesn't happen all at once. It's just little things by little things you just let pile up. There's an illustration where if you have one piece of paper, you can just rip that up easily. But if you allow pieces of paper to pile on, pile on, pile on, and it gets thick as a phone book, it's not real easy to rip a phone book. Why? Because you allowed it to pile up. Now, common irritations happen all the time, but what you have to do is deal with it immediately. Common irritations happen in small groups as well. It happens in your family. Now, here's how to deal with these common irritations, especially in small group. If, 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 uh, here's, here are some of the common irritations that happen. There, there's a person, this is the person who always come late. They're 10 minutes late to small group, and then they have to explain why they're late, interrupting group, and they spend 10 minutes explaining why they're late. That could be a common irritation. Another irritation is the person who talks too long. They just talk, 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 talk. They just love to hear themselves talk. That can happen in your small group. There's the TMI person. If you don't know what TMI stands for, that's the too much information person. This person is too descriptive about the, the surgery of their relative. Like, you don't have to be that descriptive. You, yeah. There can be also the, the score check person. This person is always checking the scores of whatever game is going on right now. That could be a common irritation. Another common irritation is the dogmatic person. This person says, that's just the way it is in the discussion. That can be an irritation. Another irritation is the person who's the stand-up comedian. Everything is a joke. All right, here's my time. Here, here's, this is Def Jam comedy hour for me right now, this small group. Another one is the person who forget to bring the snacks. They always forget to bring the snacks. It's like, it was your turn to bring the guacamole. There's also, in the small group community, this person is known as the EGR. This is the extra grace required person. Right? This person is the person that misses all of the social signals. Right? We all know who that person is. This person is just a little bit off. You're all thinking about the person that is that person in your small group. That's the EGR. If you can't think about the person that is in your small group, then you are that person in your small group. You are that EGR. But all of these common irritations occur in a small group, in your family, at work. All of these things happen. So what do you do with these little irritations? One, you ask God to fill you up with so much love that that irritation doesn't bug you anymore. That's one way to rip that sheet of paper. Ask God to fill you with your love, and that overflowing love just covers over that irritation. Now, if that doesn't work, the second thing that you do is that you go to that person one-on-one -on -one and you talk to them personally. And you say this, in love, you say, you know what, maybe it's just me, but I noticed that you're a jerk. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You don't say that. You don't say that for real. Don't, don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. You come to them and say, it may be me. I'm sorry, but this kind of bugs me. Can we talk about this? That's how you start that off. All right. So, but what you don't do is you don't let that irritate you, and then you talk to everybody else about that irritation. You talk to everybody in the small group. You talk to all of your friends about this person in your small group. No, you don't do that. Two people you talk to about it. God, you ask God to fill you with love, and the other person is the offender themselves. That's it. Let me clarify something. Anger is not always wrong, but resentment is always wrong. You can be angry about things like the social injustice, injustice that goes on in this world. I, I can be angry at, about that. You know, anger is sometimes a result of love. If someone hurts my kids, I am going to be angry about that because of the love I have for my kids. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. So that means that you can get angry without sinning. So it's not about being angry, all right? It's about being resent, resentful. And resentment is always wrong. 
God says don't be resentful for two reasons. One is that when you get resentful, you stop thinking clearly. You can't see, you can't think clearly, you can't think straight, you get all emotional, and, and you, you just can't think clearly anymore. You can't think rational anymore. And the second thing, it, it leads to you, you start to act in a self-defeating way. Right? It's like you're drinking poison to kill the other person. Or, or you're going to shoot yourself hoping that the kickback of the gun hits the other person. That doesn't make sense. You're defeating yourself in that situation. So one of the purposes of small group, why we have small group, is so that other people can help you to think straight when you've been hurt. So that when you get hurt, other people can surround you and think straight for you, think rational for you. Because when you're resentful, when you started to get embittered, you don't see things clearly and you start acting in self-defeating ways. So when you go into your small group and you say, this thing happened to me, to me and I just wanted to choke that fool. Someone else in your small group can say, you know what? You don't really want a lawsuit, do you? Okay, so how about this and that? All right? They help you to think straight. It says this in Hebrews 12. Look after each other. Watch out. No, no, I'm sorry. Let's go back. Psalm 73, verse 21 and 22 says this. Since my heart was embittered, that means jealous, I'm not resentful, and my soul deeply wounded, I was stupid and could not understand. That's what it says in the Bible. So when you're resentful, when you get embittered about something, you just become stupid. And you need other people to help you to not be stupid. Now, has anyone ever done anything that they later saw that they were stupid? Yes, we all get stupid at times. And it's okay to get stupid, but you need other people around you to unstupid you. <laughs> right? To help you to not be stupid. So that's why you need a small group. The purpose of a small group is found in Hebrews 12, verse 15, and it says, look after each other. Our responsibility is to look after each other. Watch out that what? No bitterness. No resentfulness. Resentment. No resentment takes root among you. We are to look out for each other. For as it springs up, it causes what? Deep trouble hurting many in their spiritual lives. So don't be stupid, stupid. All right, be in a small group. So when someone in your small group is hurt, you gather around them and you help them from getting bitter against it. That is how we grow. The reality is that people we want to love the most, we end up resenting the most. And like parents, or even your spouse. But what do you need as an antidote to resentment? And my last point is forgiveness. Forgiveness builds relationships. If you want to have a long-term marriage, you have to have a massive dose of forgiveness. Forgiveness needs to be in constant rotation. Forgiveness has to always be there if you want any long-lasting relationship. It says here in Colossians 3, you must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So why should I forgive other people? Because one, resentment doesn't work. We already know that. It's like shooting yourself, hoping the other person gets hurt by it. It makes you miserable. So forgiveness is for your benefit. It's your benefit. Also, why should I forgive other people? Because you have been forgiven by God. God forgives you, so you got to forgive other people. Why do we forgive? Because you're going to need forgiveness in the future. The Lord's prayer says this, forgive us 
our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. That means, so God, I want you to forgive me as much as I forgive other people. So you need to forgive other people. Well, some people will say, I just can't do it. I cannot forgive that person. So what do you need? You need Jesus Christ. Because our human love, it, it runs out. But, but what we need is God's supernatural love. It's a love that never runs out. We just have to tap into it. Human love, that runs out. It's limited. But you need God's supernatural love within us. Titus 3 says this, Once our lives were full of resentment and envy, but then Christ saved us. Not because we were good enough to be saved, but because of his kindness and love. By washing away our sins and giving us this new joy of the indwelling Holy Spirit, all because of what Jesus our Savior did so that he could declare us good in God's eyes. You need to experience God in your life. You'll never be able to let go, let it go until you get God's love in you every day and every moment. Now, forgiveness is not making excuses for that person who hurt you. No, they did hurt you. Forgiveness is not minimizing that hurt. No, it did hurt. Forgiveness is not justifying it, saying it's not, it's not a big deal. No, it is a big deal. Forgiveness is not saying it wasn't wrong. No, it was wrong. What is forgiveness? Letting go of the pain and letting go of the rights to get even. You have every right to get even, but letting go of that right, letting go of the pain and letting go of the rights to get even. Why? For your own sake. All right, because you are going to be living in misery if you hold on to that. Let go. Some of you are still allowing people from your past to, um, um, to affect your future, to affect your present right now. You know what? They can't hurt you anymore. The past is past. The past has passed. Let it go. Every time you hold on to that grudge, you're perpetuating your own pain. Some people are still living up to the standards of their passed away parents or grandparents. And they're still trying to live up to prove their parents who's no longer in the picture wrong. You need to let go of that. God wants us to just let it go. Amen. Let it go. Cue the Frozen song. <clears throat> no, I'm not going to sing it. Forgiveness is the only way to get on with your life. And if I sang, I would have needed your forgiveness. Even though, you know, they don't deserve your forgiveness. Even though they don't deserve it, you have to forgive them. Because you didn't deserve God's forgiveness. So you have to free freely give it. Because resentment... What it does is that it turns your heart into a desert, and it dries you up emotionally. You don't have anything to give to anybody else because you're so dried up. You don't have anything to give to your spouse. You don't have anything to give to your kids. You don't have anything to give to your, your parents, your friends. You don't have anything to give because you're dried up with resentment. You're stuck in the past, and you can't get on with the future. It turns you into a barren desert, and it dries you up. But you know what? God brought you here this morning. God allowed you to click on LighthouseSJ.Church to log in right now to hear this. He's got some good news for you. And it says here in Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19, it says this. This is the Lord speaking. He says this, forget 
what happened before and do not think about the past. I am going to do something new with you. I will make rivers on dry land. God is saying that I am going to to turn that desert that you are in right now, the desert that that is, is your heart, he's going to turn that into something new. He's going to turn that into something with rivers. He's going to turn it into an oasis. But you have to allow God to do it. You may have had some relational disasters in your life. You know what? Welcome to the human race. Everybody has had some relational disasters. Everybody. What are you going to do with them? God wants to start something new, totally new in your life today. But it starts with you opening up your life to Jesus Christ and letting him fill you with his love on a moment-by-moment basis on a second-by-second basis. Every single moment, God wants to fill you with his love, but you have to open up to him. As we bow our heads and close our eyes, as we close, let me ask you four very personal questions. First, Who do you need to be more unselfish with? Who have you been critical or judgmental of? Have you been unwilling to admit I was wrong? I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Who do you need to say that to? I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Have you been afraid of being real with other people? And you've held your cards close and you've denied your emotions and you've hidden your emotional nakedness? Is there anybody in your life that you have shared that secret with? You're only as sick as your secrets. Who do you need to forgive? All four of the antidotes to resentment, to secured insecurity, to selfishness, and to pride. All four of these antidotes are found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You get that relationship lined up and all the other ones will fall into place. Thank you, Jesus, for that. You need to allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord and manager, to be the boss of your life. Let him fill you with his love, and you'll start to have great relationships with other people. So I want you to pray this prayer in your heart. Dear Jesus, You've seen every relationship I've ever had. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You know how selfishness and pride and insecurity and resentment messes them up. I admit that I need your help, Jesus, in my life and in my relationships. As much as I understand, as much as I know how, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life and live through me and put your love through me. I want that fresh start that you offer. I want that new beginning that you offer. I want you to turn my heart that is a barren desert right now into the vivacious oasis that you promised me. Take my heart right now, God. Help me. Guide me. Protect
protect me.